Okay, good morning. Good morning. Please take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 5. <coughs> Romans chapter 5. Today we're going to begin uh, the, um, the argument of Paul that starts in, in verse 12. Uh, it doesn't end until the end of chapter 8, but uh, <coughs> we're only going to basically look at 12 to 21. Now, what I mean by we're going to look at 12 to 21, I really mean we're only going to start looking at 12 to 21. Uh, I know that we will not get through it, so we're going to stop where we stop um, <coughs> this morning. So, and the reason why I say that is because <coughs> this section of Romans really needs to be studied carefully. Uh, it has been the source, well, let me rephrase that. The various interpretations of the, this have been the source of a lot of false teaching, a lot of bad teaching. And, and uh, so I, I think it's important that we get this right. So we're going to go through it carefully and slowly. <clears throat> so today what I'm going to do is, is I want to set up uh, the reason for these verses. Uh, the, there's a question that comes out of the first part of chapter 5 that Paul has to answer. And verses 12 to 21 are his answer <laughs> to this question. Now, if you just go back and read those first 11 verses, you're not going to see the question unless you really think about what Paul has said there in, in those verses. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to go back there, look at what he said, and go, oh, wait a minute, that means this. And it brings a question to our minds. And, and we'll bring a question to all of our minds. And uh, that's what Paul's going to answer. So we need to see that that is uh, the flow of Paul's argument uh, throughout the book of Romans. <clears throat> now, so we're, we're going to read the, these verses, 12 to 21, because I want them in your, in your mind as we're going through it, even though we won't look at all of the verses today. But before I do that, I want to say something about English translations. Uh, so when it comes to English translations, you all know that the... The, the Bible is, uh, is written in three original languages, right? The Old Testament is predominantly Hebrew uh, with some Aramaic sections, like particularly the first couple of chapters, uh, first three chapters or so of the book of Daniel. Um, but uh, most of it's Hebrew. And the New Testament is written mostly in what language? In the Greek language. <coughs> So we, we don't have any of the original documents, but there's thousands and thousands and thousands of manuscripts that have been discovered all over the world that when you put them together, they, they pretty much agree with one another, and there we are able to put together a master manuscript of the original languages that we are like 99.9 .9 certain represent the originals. Now there are some areas that, that causes concern because uh, in languages that have accents, uh, that uh, different accents change the meaning of the word, uh, you can understand that with the way manuscripts are formed and, and copyists that, that they could have left out an, uh, an accent or put an accent in. And so, so there are a few mistakes like that. But there's no error in terms of the teaching, right? And so that's what we mean when we say the Bible is an error. But what I want to say about English translations, and, and I've taught this to you before, is, is that English translations have two extremes. So there is the literal translation over here. So they're, they're trying to, to bring out the, from the original a word-for-word -word document. The problem is, is that, that in these uh, uh, literal translations or formal equivalent is the technical term for them, is that you can't read it very well in English. So, so they got to fill in spots or they got to change some of the words. So, so they can't really bring a, a literal translation in order to make it readable. On the other side, the other end of the spectrum, you have the paraphrase or what is technically called the dynamic equivalent. So it's, it's not word for word, but it's thought for thought. So they're, they're taking the thought of the author and putting it <coughs> into their own words. Now the, the problem is, is they think that the author is saying what they think the author is saying. So the, the farther out you go into a paraphrase, so if you read the Message Bible, okay, uh, that's one man's opinion of what the thought of the author is saying. 
and, and uh, Eugene Peterson is, is so wrong in so many places, it makes the message a version you should never read, okay? Um, <clears throat> for that reason alone. Now, the best way to study is to get a, 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 um, <clears throat> a literal word-for-word -word translation. <clears throat> well, the actual best way is to study the languages and know the languages and read from the original. That would be the, the best way. So wh why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because... Um, <clears throat> Because English translations, in order to make it readable for us, have to leave out words. And, and the most important words, particularly in the Greek language, are the conjunctions, the prepositions, the adverbs, and, and, um, um, and, and those kinds of things, those little words. But so often in our translations, we leave those out. But they are very, very important to understanding what the author is saying. But in English, it doesn't translate well because it's, it's, that is the key to the Greek language, these little tiny words. And so they're left out. And what happens is, is we can read it slowly. We get the main gist of it. But oftentimes, it doesn't really reflect the truth. And chapter 5 is one of those chapters where the prepositions are left out a lot and uh, we get some um, some things that are not quite right and, and a couple places some things that are actually right down wrong. So, <clears throat> so we'll, we use the ESV Bible here in our church and, and the English Standard Version and the reason we use it is because it is uh, one of the easier to read literal translations. So on the spectrum, it's closer this side. So a more literal one than it would be um, the New American Standard Bible, um, or the um, uh, there's another one in there. I forget now what it is. And then even then there's Young's literal translation. Then there's the uh, um, the Alice view, which is the literal standard Bible. And, and then uh, you get one that is actually so wooden, it's just exactly word for word in the Greek order, and uh, you can't read that in English, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. But <clears throat> So the ESV is, is more literal, um, and it has fairly good presuppositions, because this is the thing, when you leave out words, now you have to fill in to make it readable, but you fill it in with your presupposition, because you assume that the author is saying this based on what you, your presupposition is or your systematic theology, and so you fill it in. So the ESV uh, 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 translators have fairly good um, uh, presuppositions. It's not the best presuppositions, but, but uh, they're fairly good, and so that's why we, we use it. And of course it is readable. It's not perfect by any means. I mean, you hear me lots of times saying it would be better if it was translated this way or the original Greek, the literal Greek would say it this way. You hear me say that a lot. That's not to put the ESV down. That, that's to say that, that to, to acknowledge that there's problems uh, in translating it from the original language into our language so that we can understand. <clears throat> now, the... So it so leaves out words. So having said that, we're going to use the ESV as our starting point, uh, and we're going to continue the study, because hopefully that's what you all have in your hands. Um, actually, if you're using your phone this morning, and you have the capability of getting other translations, if you can find the, the LSV, the literal standard version, that would be a good version to, to follow along with. Okay, it's, it's a really good literal one. But again, it's, they call it wooden, it's very wooden, so it's difficult when you're just reading it. And so, so what I have done, which I do all the time, is, is I do my own translations. Uh, it's called a morphology. You take the original man manuscript, you go through all of the rules of grammar, and, 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 and I write my own translation. Um, and I try in my own translation to be as literal uh, to everything that is in the Greek. So I, might, I use that in the background, but I'm also using the LSV uh, as a guide 
when we go through this. So this, so that's why it's important to have a literal translation so that we are able to follow Paul's argument. We want to get it right, right? Right? We want to get it right? Okay, good. <clears throat> so, 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 I, I don't understand. Oh, uh, that's it. I won't go there. Okay, so having said that, follow along then as I read. And I'm going to read it from the ESV. Uh, but as we study it, we'll look at, at things. Now, so I want the boys and girls to again listen for the word death and died. Okay, death and died. So it's the same that, that was in the other, but we're not looking at resurrection this time. We want to look at the words death and died. So beginning in verse 12 of Romans chapter 5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin... And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who is to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died... Through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> Alright, so... so um, any, any, any of the boys and girls want to tell us how many times they heard the word death? <coughs> Valerie? Five. Five times. Anybody hear a different time? Scarlett? Six. Six, okay. Yeah, I think there's six, Valerie. Well, there's five death and, and one died. Yeah, that's what I counted. Yeah, oh, okay. I just told you the death. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so there's six all together. All right, so keep that in mind because I'm going to ask that question again later. So, here we go. So, the, the greatest threat to the gospel in the first century was what? What do you think it was? The greatest threat to the gospel in Paul's day was what? Hey, nobody ever asked you that question before? Is it Judaism? It's Judaism, yeah. It, it's Jewish theology. Okay, because when, when, the, uh, when the Gentiles became believers, they believed that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah and the Savior. What did the Jews tell the Gentiles they had to do? Be they had to be circumcised. They had to become a Jew and follow the law. Well, that's Jewish thought. That's not Christian thought. Okay? And, and when Jews believed that Jesus was the Messiah, what, did they, what, was, what were they told? They have to stay under the law. They have to follow the, the, uh, the dress code. They have to follow the feast. They have to, to do everything that is Jewish. And, and so what we had was this problem in Rome, in the Roman church, among the Christians there, which was started mainly by Jewish Christians who probably were at the Feast of, Pente Feast of Weeks on Pentecost. And, okay, and, uh, but then the, uh, the uh, Pharaoh, not the Pharaoh, the Caesar kicked the Jews out 
because of the, the fighting in fighting between the Christian Jews and the non-Christian Jews, kicked them out of Rome for a period of four years. And when they come back, the, the church was now predominantly Gentile in nature and had no Jewish influence at all. And so they were, they were confused by this, and it was causing problem within the Christian church because the Jewish Christians said, we, we got to still follow the, the law. And, and the Gentile Christians were saying, no, the, the council of Jerusalem said that we don't have to follow the law. And so they said, well, well, that's only if you're a Gentile Christian. But if you're a Jewish Christian, you still have to follow the law. And, and the, then they argued it back and forth. And some, well, wait a minute, is that right? And so there's this confusion that was going on, and this is the main reason Paul wrote the book of Romans. Okay? It's not a systematic theology of justification by faith. It's in there, but that's not why he wrote it. He wrote it to deal with this question, are the Jewish Christians under the law? What is the, their relationship to the old covenant law? And so he writes this book to answer that question for them. So, so this becomes a problem because, because the Jews are still having this influence on them because they haven't fully answered uh, the, the problem. <clears throat> and uh, so Paul is going to argue that the law had a specific purpose for a specific time for a specific people. And that now that Christ has come, that purpose has been fulfilled and the time of the Old Covenant is over, and those people are no longer under it. So Judaism, of course, stayed under it because they didn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So they think that, 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 the, that it hasn't been fulfilled and that they're still there. But Christian Jews know better that Jesus is the Messiah. So the problem is that the Jews under Judaism and being influenced by Jewish theology believe that the reason you have to stay under the law is because the, by being a Jew under the law, you are in fact righteous before God. It, it's a matter of, uh, of privilege of being a Jew. That's, you're saved because you have the law. And uh, you made covenant with God through circumcision. And that makes you saved. And, and Paul is going to deal with this um, and uh, Paul's argument he will explain the purpose of the law where it stood in history and where it now stands that Jesus the Messiah has come. So you, you got to follow Paul's argument through the letter. He starts off by saying in chapter 1 in verse 16 that the power of God for salvation is for those who believe. Did he put a period there? Look at verse 16. Is there a period? What did he say? For the Jews first. For the Jew first and for the Greeks. So he already started to make this division. He says, okay, let's break this down then. And he's going to go to the Old Testament Jewish person, the person under the law, and he says, let's take a look at your claims here. Let's take a look at what Jewish theology says and how it compares to Christian theology. And, and uh, so it, all through chapter 1, 2, and 3, he deals with that period of time. And he separates it out. He says, okay, you think that because you are under the law, you're righteous and you are saved. And the Gentile, because he is not under the law, is dead in his sins. That's what they believed. That's what they thought. And, and they thought that, hey, we've got the answer to everybody. All you got to do is become a Jew, because if you were circumcised and become a Jew under the law, now you are righteous before God. That's Jewish theology. And Paul takes that whole time, particularly chapter 2, to debunk that theology. He showed that the Jew and the Gentile are equally lost. That the Jew and the Gentile, regardless of whether they have the law or don't have the law, are not righteous because they all sin. Here in Romans 3.23, all have sinned. All, Jew and Gentile, have sinned. Jew under the law, Gentile without the law. They have sinned and come under the judgment of God. And what is God's judgment? We're going to look at this earlier. So 118 says, the wrath of God is revealed against them because of this. So that's the way Paul starts off. 
And, and, and then in chapter 4, he says, okay, let's look at another period of history. Because the Jews say to them, say to Paul, okay, okay, Paul, um, all right, you say that the, the law doesn't save us. And, and that we're, we're equally as lost as the Gentiles. That, but what about Abraham? Abraham was righteous, and he's the father of the Jews. And so they're claiming now in Jewish theology that salvation not only comes by the <laughs> law, but salvation comes by being a relative, a physical relative of Abraham. Because Abraham was righteous. So therefore everybody born to Abraham and his offspring are righteous. They forget, of course, that Ishmael was his first son, which means that all of the Arabs, under their argument, would also be righteous. Right? So he goes back to Abraham in chapter 4. He says, okay, let's look at Abraham. Abraham was declared righteous because he obeyed a law? No. He says Abraham was declared righteous because he believed God. There was no law for him to believe. So righteousness for Abraham had nothing to do with the law. It had nothing to do with him being a Jew or a Gentile. In fact, Abraham was not a Jew. Did you ever think of that? Abraham was a Gentile. This is the Jewish nation. They called them Jews after that, after the law came. From between the time of Abraham and Moses, they were called Hebrews. When the law was given, they were called Israelites. And, and after the, the Babylonian captivity, because they no longer had their own nation, they, be, they were known as Jews. Okay? And <clears throat> so that's an important little side to, to understand. So then, then Paul says in, in chapter 3, verse 21, he says, he says, but now, and there he means, by now that Christ has come, now that the Messiah has come, so now he's changing his time again. Um, boy, something's happening. Ambulances and fire. 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 Um, another emergency vehicle. Okay, so where am I? Oh, yeah. So, but now, now that Christ has come, he says, and, uh, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. So, so what is he saying there? This is a really stark statement to say, particularly to someone with a Jewish background. He says, the righteousness of God was revealed apart from the law. You do not need the law to understand how to be made righteous with God. That, that's a big deal to a Jewish person. But that's what he's saying there. In verse 22 he says, The righteousness of God through faith is what the ESV says, but um, this is one of those places where I told you about it. It's actually a wrong interpretation because they're trying to make it readable. But the word here is not the word faith, it's the word faithfulness. In fact, we sang this in, in the song just prior to this about the faithfulness of Jesus. And that's what it is. The righteousness of God through faith or through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to all. Okay, so righteousness comes by the faithfulness of Jesus to do everything God sent him to do to deal with the problem of our lostness, our sinfulness. And... <clears throat> And, and he did it all for those who would believe, Jew or Gentile. There's no difference. Verse 23, for all Jews and Gentiles have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, just as all Jews and Gentiles who believe are justified, <coughs> excuse me, justified by grace in 3.24. So Paul's bringing this whole argument. So, so he looked at, at uh, the Old Testament time. When the law existed, then he looked at the time of Abraham before the law ever came. And then he, he looked a little, little bit of, of the time when, when Christ came and what he did in reference to the law. And that the righteousness of God was, was revealed apart from the law, not through the law at all. And, um, <clears throat> and then now in chapter 5, uh, <clears throat> he's going to introduce another period of time. So if you look at chapter uh, or verse 12, it says there again, uh, get it here. Therefore sin came into the world through one man. Who's that one man? Adam. 
okay? So now he's going to go back even farther in history to the beginning of it all to Adam himself and say, okay, this is, this is a long, this is a long time before Abraham. It's also an even longer time before the law came in. So let's put everything into perspective. Okay, all of this is to prove in his argument that the old covenant is finished. It is not required anymore. It fulfilled its duty, its job. And, and if you remember in chapter 3, verse 20, he gave one reason for the purpose of the law. What was it? Do you remember? The end of verse 20. The knowledge of sin. The knowledge of sin. The knowledge of sin. Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Okay, I, I didn't know I sinned until the law said this is this is sin. When the law said this was sin, then I realized, oh, gee, I've been doing that for years. I didn't know I was sinning, but now I know I sin. You see? And that's what the law did. It, it revealed what sin is. So now the people knew what God expected. But they still couldn't keep it. They still couldn't keep it, but they still claimed their righteousness because of being under the law. All right, so, so this brings us now to chapter 12, um, verse, or chapter 5, verse 12. So in, now in order to understand, and hopefully you can follow me through this, in order to understand chapters, verses 12 to 21, we need again to keep it in context. So our English Bibles here, again, they, they tend to make this a new section. So how many of your Bibles uh, has a a new section there, it's a capital letter to begin the verse, and it has a title over the top. Okay, everybody, what's the title? Death and Adam, 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 Life. Yeah, Death and Adam, Life. Okay, so the, the interpreters, um, the editors, are trying to tell you that, okay, this is a brand new section, a brand new thought, okay? But we need to understand that verse 12 is so connected because they missed this. All right, so verse 12 begins in most translations with what word? Therefore. Therefore. With a capital T. With a capital T. Okay? But it's not therefore. It's not the word therefore. Okay? This was their understanding again, their interpretation of what Paul is doing, and, and not sticking to the, the text. Um, but rather, in the Greek language, it is the word through this, or because of this. Okay, so he said something in the verses before, and he says, now because of this, it's because of this that I'm going to now tell you that it answers the question that comes out of what I said before. Because of what? See, Paul is going to explain or answer a question that comes out of the previous verses. Now, so what's going to happen, what we're going to discover here is that verse 12 is going to explain verse 9, and verse 9 is restated in verse 10, and the point is summarized in verse 11. <laughs> okay. Can you follow me there? All right. So look, look, look back at verse 9. So, so what is this? So what is the question that Paul is going to answer? Verse 9, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more we shall be saved by him from the wrath of God. Now, just let that maul in your brains for a minute. Okay, we've been justified. We are now saying, right now, because of my faith, I am justified by the blood of Christ. But I'm going to be saved from the wrath in the future. It's future tense. Wait a minute. I'm saved now but I'm not going to be saved until the future. You follow me? Now, I'm going to come back to that, but first I want to show you where Paul is going. So turn over to chapter 6, verse 23. You all know this verse. It's a very familiar verse. We use it all the time in evangelism. Um, um, but do we really understand what Paul is saying? Okay, this is where Paul is going, going to go in his argument in verses 12 to 21. So look at, first, look at 6.23. For the wages of sin is? Death. death. But the free gift of God is? Eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. So, so we have death. We have <clears throat> sin. And by the way, sin in this verse is singular. 
Well, that's weird. Well, he could be using it to take all of our sin and lump it in as a single point. Could. Then we have free gift, and we have eternal life. Okay, those are those are the points that are there. But 623 is a summary of what 5, 12 to 21 is all about. So look back at chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. So in verses 15 and 16, you see the words free gift. You see that there? Okay. You also see one man's trespass or one man's sin. Okay. And, and look at verse 21. It says eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almost the exact same phrase in 623. And, and, and the word death occurs how many times in these verses? Valerie, how many times? Yeah, everybody else? Six times! Okay, you, you see how the, Paul is, is bringing through the argument in chapter 5, and it will continue through chapter 6, and the last verse of chapter 6 is the summary of what he's talking about. So we can't understand the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of Christ is um, the gift of God is eternal life until we know what those words mean. And we get that from chapter 5. Okay? So it's a parallel thing here. He's building this argument that's going to be summarized. So what we know now is that, that Paul is beginning a discussion on death, sin, free gift, eternal life. So now let's go back to chapter 5, verse 9. Chapter uh, verse 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. He's already talked about this, and, but he's bringing, making it a little clear. In verse 1, he, he said um, that we have therefore since, and, and by the way, there is no since in the original language, therefore we have been justified by faith, because it connects to the last verses of chapter 4. We have peace with God, and God is at peace with us, and so forth. Right? So, so he's, he's bringing it through. He says, in fact, God showed his love to us by when we were still sinning, Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. Okay? And, and that, that's the demonstration uh, of God's love. And, uh, um, and by his blood that we, have, we are now justified. It's because we believe, we believe, and not by any law, but by our faith in the action of Jesus in dying on the cross, shedding his blood, we know that right now we are justified. Justification, ju being justified, is a declaration by a judge. Not that we are sinless, but that we are righteous. And righteous implies that we have no sin. We have no guilt of sin. There's nothing guilty, okay? God has listened to the arguments. So why are you standing here? So like, it's like God saying to a person when they die, and they stand before the, the pearly gates. I, I found out this week, don't do this if you have an Apple phone, because apparently it makes balloons float. <laughs> Did you see that, Joe? I saw the balloons, but I didn't yeah. know he came. He figured out why. Yeah, he discovered why. Okay. okay. <laughs> <clears throat> it only happens if you have an Apple thing. Oh, now I lost my thought. The pearly gates. The pearly gates. Oh, you're standing before the pearly gates, and God says, "Why should I let you into my heaven?" And they say, "Well, I did this. I did this. It doesn't count. You're guilty because you also did this and did this and did this." He says, "Yeah, but my good outweighs my bad. You have bad, so therefore you are a sinner. You have broken my laws. You are guilty, and the punishment for sin is death." You see. Okay, so we stand there, and he says, why should I let you in my heaven? And, and we go, because Jesus died in my place? Welcome in. You see, it's different. Because we are justified by faith. It has nothing to do with a law, of obeying the law, doing anything. Uh, it, it's, it's all what Jesus has done. So he says this. We have been justified. And so God says, hey, you're not guilty. You have no guilt. So there is no judgment on you. Because what does the judge say? If, if, he, if we're not guilty, 
What does he say? You're going to spend 20 years or the rest of your life in prison. Does the judge say that? No. When we're not guilty, what does he say? You are not guilty. Go free. Okay, I give you life. See where I'm going with this. And, and so this, this is what, what Paul is saying. So, so um, and, and even Paul declares that, that them to be righteous, so even as verse 1 says, by faith. So this is their status. It's their standing before God as their judge. So Paul goes on in verse 9, and he says, but more than that. Now, how can there be anything more than the fact that Jesus died for us and we're now justified? But, but uh, and, and this is another place where in our English Bibles, they got it wrong. Because the more than that actually is at the beginning of the sentence and not in the middle where the ESV puts it, where most English versions put it. It's not there in the middle. The more than that, more than that is at the beginning. So the more than that is actually what he said in verse 8. And in verse 8, he said, more than God showing his love to us by sending his son to die for us while we were still sinners, more than that, we have been justified by his love. He, not, Jesus didn't, didn't, not only did he die for us as our propitiation, but Jesus, uh, but God has also declared us righteous. More than that, he declared us righteous. And, and, and he says, and, and, and more than that, we shall be saved from the wrath of God. See that at the end of verse 9? Now, the first thing you need to know here about this last phrase of verse 9 is that the words of God do not exist in the original. They should be in italics or something like that so you understand that the editors put it in. It's their understanding to make it more readable in the English they are making an assumption that when Paul wrote the word wrath, he means the anger of God. And so they said, the wrath of God. Because that's how we understand. Wrath. When we talk about the wrath of God, some, the fury, the anger, the, that's what we think of, isn't it? Okay? So, but the all of God is not there. And the definite article is there. So what the original actually says is, we will be saved by him from the wrath. See, so there's something specific about the wrath. What is the wrath? So is he using wrath here in the sense of, of God's anger? Or is he using wrath here in the sense of judgment or punishment? Well, we need to try to understand it. So, what does Paul mean by math? Wrath. Math. <laughs> I know what I think of math. Anyways, so he, he's already introduced this concept of wrath. Uh, he's actually done it in four places. The okay, first time he talks about the word wrath is chapter 1, verse 18. We're going to look at that one. The second time is in chapter 2, verse 5. We're going to look at that one. But then I'm just going to very quickly summarize the other two, okay? Because they're, they're and, and by the way, they're all exactly the same. So, to, so look back to chapter 1, verse 18. So it begins, for the wrath of God. Now, this time of God is in the text, right? So he, he's, Paul is telling us that this wrath, the source of it is God. That's okay. Okay, the source of it is God. <clears throat> it is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, the Greek word wrath means either anger or punishment. <laughs> anger or punishment. So if you're going to translate it, you have to ask yourself, Okay, how do I know which one it is? Is it talking about his anger, his emotion, or is it talking about his judgment? How do we know? What do we have to look at? The see, context, right? The context. We don't just make it up. Okay, now, you could go to your systematic theology books, which will tell you that wrath is always the emotion of God, his anger. But guess what? Theology 
Theolo systematic theology has that wrong. Because what the systematic theology does is it pulls out every verse that has the word wrath, and they look at it and they say, okay, the majority of these are talking about his emotion of anger. So therefore, wrath is anger. So you take that conclusion, and you come to this verse, and you say, oh, well, wrath is anger. That's a given. Okay? But it can, it's not always anger. So you don't look at that. You have to look at the context to figure it out. So let's see if we can figure it out. Okay, so um, what you, you can replace the word wrath with anger. So then it would say, for the anger of God is revealed. And, and that sounds right, doesn't it? Because God, God certainly, especially in the Old Testament, um, when you read some of the, the, the way God communicated, particularly to the Israelites, I mean, he was pretty angry. He was pretty emotional about things. And, and so uh, he was revealing his emotion of anger, that's for sure. So it, it, it can fit. But you can also replace the word wrath with, with the word punishment. So, so um, um, for the punishment of God is revealed against ungodliness. Well, well that fits too, doesn't it? Because there is a punishment for sin. So now you read the rest of the, the verses, and what you do is you say, so are the rest of the verses talking about God's punishment, or are they talking about God's uh, emotion <coughs> in response to sin? And as you go through, you, you discover that oh, all the way through there, and we don't have time to go through it all, so you'll have to trust me here, but read it yourself. And you discover that it's not talking about God's emotion at all, but it's talking about his judgment against those who sin. So especially when you look at verse um, uh, 32, okay, so in verse 32 he says, God's decree, well this is God's judgment, God's decree is that those who practice such things, so all he's done so far is identified what evil people do, so the people who practice such things, what is God's judgment on them? What do they deserve? They deserve to die. They deserve to die. Now here's the key. It doesn't say that God's decree is that those who practice such things die, but that they deserve to die. So that means that the judgment of death already exists. And all he's saying is, now I've identified all of the evil things that people do. And the people that do these evil things, they deserve the judgment that I already gave on sin, which is death. You follow me? Death is already the punishment, and they deserve that because of the acts of sin that they do. And then in the beginning of chapter 2, the first three or four verses... Paul says the same thing now about the Jews, because if they looked at the end of chapter 1 and the Jewish people would say, well, there, you see, there's our proof. Those are the Gentiles. And then in chapter 2, he says, wait a minute, you who judge the Gentiles by that say they're, they're guilty of sin and deserve to die, but you practice exactly the same thing, so you deserve to die. See, that's what he says to the Jews, following his, his full argument. So the question then is, when did God announce that death was the punishment for sin? Genesis. Yeah, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. Okay, he created the garden, created man, Adam, and uh, in the garden he had these different trees, and in the middle of the garden was this one tree called the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and this is what he said, 2.16. The Lord God commanded the man. What is that? That's a law. The Jews had a law, but the law did not bring them righteousness. Between Adam, or Abraham and Moses, there was no law, but God, Abraham was made righteous because of his faith. And, and now we go back to Adam. Oh, now we have a law again. Now, when we get to chapter 12, remember what we read? It says, it says, the offense of the one is not like the offense of the other. And the gift is not. Okay, he's going to talk about, it's all about whether there was a law or not. So keep this in mind. <clears throat> So, God commanded the man, that's Adam, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, here's my judgment, you will surely die. die. <coughs> Adam, you eat that, death is your reward. 
Death is your wages. The wages of sin is death. Okay? So death was already in the world. God had already pronounced the judgment. And the judgment is death. And now all of these people after Adam have committed all of these horrendous sins. And he now says, says they deserve that judgment. He's talking about that judgment that God declared to Adam. So the wrath of God is his judgment of death on all sinners. Now jump quickly to Romans 2 verse 5. In 2 5 Paul talks about a future day. And he says there's coming in the future a day of wrath when God's righteous, what's the next word? Judgment. God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Oh, okay, you see the connection between wrath and judgment again? His judgment will be revealed. In other words, that God was right in putting them to death as the judgment. Okay, so that's a day that's coming. Then he, he talks about, uh, again, the distinction between Jews and Gentiles, that the Jew will even, those who were under the law will be brought forth, and he will even judge them by on the basis of what the law told them. And they will be found guilty. And the Gentile will be stood be, stand before God, and he'll say, okay, but I gave you a conscience. What did your, your conscience made you guilty? Okay, so that they're, they're, because they're equally sinners. One was not better than the other. Uh, look at verse 2 and 3. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. The judgment of death rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, that's the, the Jewish man, do you, you who judge those who practice such things, which they think are Gentiles, and yet you do them yourself, Jew, that you will escape the judgment of God? No, you're not going to escape. That is God's judgment. It was given back in Genesis. So when Jesus died on the cross, we say, of course, that he bore the wrath of God. And have you ever heard preachers say that before? That Jesus bore the wrath of God. Okay, what do we think? His anger. We think that it's his anger. It's not. He bore the judgment. Because what did Jesus do? He died. The wrath of God is the penalty of death. Jesus died. There's actually there's no place anywhere in the Bible that says that Jesus um, uh, bore God's wrath. It doesn't exist. It, it's a systematic theology uh, presupposition that we have. Because, and it comes from what we think propitiation is. Now if you look at chapter 3 of Romans, in verse 24, it says God put forth Jesus Christ as a propitiation by his blood. Okay, so what does that word propitiation mean? Okay, we talked about it a little bit before, but let me, let me give it to you again. So propitiation is a pagan term. And what it means is to appease a god. So I'm going to go on a trip. I want to make sure that I have a safe trip, that no storms come up in my little boat as I cross the Aegean Sea. So I'm going to appease the gods so they will be favorable to me. That's how it's used in pagan culture. Right? But when it was brought into Christian culture, it's not about appeasing the God. That's where the, the theologian comes up with satisfaction. We are we're making God satisfied. No. Okay. It, it, we're, it, it's implying, again, emotion. He's angry with us. And we're going to take away the anger so that he can now show his love. That's not propitiation. In fact, the Greek word for, that is used here for propitiation is the same word that in every place in the Old Testament is translated mercy seat. So here, here's, here's what it means in Christian circles. Okay? It refers to that mercy seat where God's judgment is paid. The high priest enters the Holy of Holies. What does he do? He stands before the mercy feet and he's the mercy, not the feet, the mercy seat, and he sprinkles the blood of the animal on it. What is that blood? He, he, he's coming to God's presence. God's sitting on in judgment on the mercy seat, and he wants mercy for the people who sin. How is he going to get the mercy for the for for it? He sprinkles the blood, which tells God that somebody 
died. Somebody paid the price. There was death. So the blood was sprinkled there, the death was there, and um, um, it, it's not an appeasement of God's feelings or anger. It is the payment of death by one animal for another person. So now you see how it applies to Christ. So he is the propitiation because by his blood, by his death, the blood is the proof that he died, by his death, he paid the price. He's the one who died. The judgment of God, the wrath of God is death. And Jesus died in our place. God's judgment is death. Somebody died. So Romans 3.24, God puts forward Christ as the Pope of Jesus. And I already said that. But Peter's, Peter says the same thing. <clears throat> yeah, no. Okay. 1 Peter 2.24, you can look it up. He says the same thing. All right, the other place where wrath is mentioned in, in um, Romans is in Romans 3.5. So again, in 3.5, Paul is taking on this persona of being an Old Testament Jew under the law. And he says to them, he quotes uh, the Psalms, which talk about God overlooking David's sin so that he can fulfill the covenant. And he says, you see, so, so David's sin made God uh, merciful. So if we sin, then God will be merciful for us because he has to fulfill his covenant with us, which is we are, in fact, righteous. That's their argument. And so God would be unrighteous if he showed his wrath to us. So again, we think, well, if God would show his anger. But he's not. No, if God would show death to us. Because we're righteous. How can a righteous man die? Death is the punishment or the penalty for sin. I'm righteous. You see, see the argument? Chapter 4, verse 15 is, is the next place uh, where it is used. And, and there it says, the law brings wrath. Just, just, Paul says, you guys think the law brings righteousness. It doesn't bring righteousness. The law brings wrath. Does that mean it brings the anger of God? No, the whole context is that the law brings death. That's the judgment of sin. The law has made, made known to us, given us the knowledge of what sin is. And now having that knowledge, we, des we still commit those sins. And we deserve to die, um, which is God's judgment of sin. So, so all the law does is it proves to us that we're sinners. And we deserve death. So coming back to Romans 5 now, I, I know we're, we're all, I'm just leading up to it here to verse 12. And we will get there. Okay. So coming back to verse 9, Romans 5, 9. Paul says, we will be saved by him from the wrath. Not the wrath of God. Now, it, it could be there because 1.18 says the wrath of God. But all of God is left out because he doesn't want us to focus on the source. He wants us to focus on the actual wrath, the judgment, the punishment, which is, the wages of sin is, death. So just to clarify it again, we'll look at verse 10, because verse 10 begins with the preposition for, which means that he is going to explain what he means by, by wrath. He says, for, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. You know, there's that life again. There's death. There's life. We're reconciled. Reconciliation means life. Sin means death. Reconciliation means life. Now, so verses 9 and 10 are actually parallel verses. So, verse 10 answers how we will be saved from the wrath. What does it say? We will be saved, you can stick it in there, from the wrath by his life. See? The original of the Greek actually is by his life. The means in which we are saved is by his life. Now, you notice here he did not say by his death because it, we've already been reconciled. We've already been justified. We're reconciled and justified by his death. He already said that earlier. He says, but now we are going to be, we need to be saved from the wrath, from the death. How are we going to be saved from the death? 
By his life. What's Jesus' life in this in this context? Hope's resurrection. Yes. But it, it's it is the resurrection. Wait a minute, I thought Jesus was dead. Didn't he die? Yeah, he died. Well, well, because of his death, he paid the, the problem, so I'm reconciled with God. But wait a minute. But here, see, now, are you seeing the question that's coming to your mind? What are you starting to think? If I am reconciled, if I am justified, if I'm forgiven of my sins, if Jesus paid the punishment, death, why am I still going to die? See that question? How many, how many thought that? Yeah. Why am I still going to die? Death has to do with sin. And, and if I'm not guilty and I don't have... And, I, and I'm not even counted as being a sinner, but I'm counted as being righteous. Christ's righteousness imputed to me, my sin imputed to him. I don't have the sin anymore. When God looks at me, he not does not see sin, whereby he says, well, you're guilty, therefore you die. But he looks at me and says, there's righteousness, you're not guilty, you're righteous. So you live. So then why is it that we still die? You see that that's the logical question that comes out of here? Well, Paul's going to answer that in verse 12. So let's go to verse 12. Sorry if I go a little longer here, but, but you've got to get this connection. So again, verse 12 does not start with the word therefore. It starts with the word because, because of this. This is why you still die, even though the penalty has been paid and you're righteous and you're forgiven, you're reconciled, you're justified. This is why you still die. This is what chapter verse 12 is saying. Because, the reason why you still die is because sin came into the world through one man and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all sin. Who's the one man again? Adam. Adam. So Paul is saying, through Adam's one sin, sin came into the world. Okay, we, we can understand that, right? That, that makes sense. Everybody after Adam sins, and they, they sin because Adam sinned and it infected us. And the whole thing of, of chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, is, is showing that it's because we have depraved minds that we, in fact, do the sin. Sin entered the world. But it came into the world because of the one sin that Adam committed. Okay? Following Paul here? Because Adam sinned, because Adam disobeyed God and ate the forbidden fruit, sin entered the world. But what else entered the world? Death. Death entered the world. How did death enter the world? Because God said, when you eat that fruit, you will die. Okay, so, so sin, Adam committed the sin, and God said, you die. What's your next question? But Adam didn't die. Why didn't Adam die? There was a death. What died? Just his body. The animal. You could have been. John's got it. John's got it. Say it, John. The animal. The animal died. God took the life of an animal, made skins as a covering, and put them on Adam and Eve. And we know later on that that became a type or a picture of Jesus in his substitutionary death, he died in our behalf. So something had to die. Adam didn't die. The animal died. But then Adam eventually died. Cain died. Eve died. Abel died. All, every single person after him had died. You and I will die. That death that we all die 
happened because of Adam's one sin. Because God's judgment is, Adam, you sin, you and your offspring will die. It was a, an all-inclusive death. So, here we have. Before Adam sinned, there wasn't sin in the world, right? Before Adam sinned, there wasn't death in the world. Which, by the way, is very important because what is the world, our world, telling us about death? It happened for millions and millions and millions of years, and we have this fossil record that proves to us that there was death for all these years. Didn't happen. Okay? Evolution is wrong just on that basis alone. There was no death in the world until Adam sinned. We can historically place Adam around uh, uh, four to 6,000, the latest maybe 10,000 BC. Not millions and millions of years. Now I'm getting off track. So, death did not exist before. There was no condemnation. But after Adam sinned, Adam and all mankind were condemned to die. Look at the verse. And so death spread to who? All men. All men. See? And again, in Paul's usage here, specifically in his letter, he's saying Jew and Gentile. The ESV translates the Greek adverb as so, but a better way should, would, to translate it would be thus. And thus, death spread to all men. Okay, the word thus is actually a very important word. Sometimes we, we use it to mean therefore, um, but it's not used that way most of the time. Thus means in this way or, or in this manner. So what Paul is saying, so if we wanted to uh, interpret it by its usage in the Greek language, we would say, and thus, or in this way, in what way? In, in, that Adam sinned, and his sin brought the judgment of death, so all men die. In this way, all men die. Are we dying because of our sin? Is that what it's saying? We're dying because of Adam's sin. So even though Jesus died for me, and I'm justified and I'm forgiven, death still occurs because of Adam's sin. Just follow with me here. The next phrase is going to make it even clearer. Death came to all men because Adam sinned. Adam sinned, and that sin brought death, and death passed through to all men through Adam's sin. So look at the last phrase of verse 12. This is where the ESV uh, went away from translating and put in their presupposition and interpreted it. And what they said, most translations say, because all sin. So who's getting the blame for dying? We're getting the blame for dying. For, it, because, because I sin, that's why I'm going to die. That's what the ESV is saying. That's what most English Bibles are saying. Okay? But the, the literal text says, upon that all sin. Upon what? So you can look at that, that and say, well, doesn't that point to our sin? Well... Every, when it says all sin, that's in the plural. But when it says that, that's in the singular. So grammatically, you've got to look at well, what, what's singular in the context so we know that the that, what that is referring to. The only thing in that verse that is singular is the one sin of Adam. And it is upon that one sin, that sin of Adam, that all sin. So God is saying that death passes on to all mankind because even though we didn't sin and we haven't sinned yet, God says you're the status of a sinner based on Adam's sin. Adam's sin made you a sinner. Adam brought death. You will die. It has nothing to do with me sinning. Upon
upon that sin, that sin of Adam. So verse, just jump down to verse 19 because he, he repeats it. But there in verse 19 he says it clearly. <laughs> For as by the one man's disobedience, so who's that? So that's Adam's disobedience, Adam's one sin. The many were made, what? Sinners. The, it doesn't say the many started sinning. The many were made Sinners. It's talking about status and position before God. We are now appointed as being sinners. All men died because Adam sinned. The day he ate the fruit, death came into the world, and all men now will die. So this is the answer to the question. Why do we still die if we're justified, reconciled, and forgiven? We still die because the penalty, the wrath, the death, still exists. It still stands on all mankind. Something has to deal with death. Does any verse come to mind? 1 Corinthians 15. Well, you got to see this then. I'm, I didn't plan on going there, but, but you got to see this. 1 Corinthians 15. Fifty-four. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, what's that word? Death, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? It's talking about that judgment of God that we all are going to die. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And earlier he said um, in verse 21, as by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. So that the last enemy is what? Death. Let me, let me, i got to point out one last verse here before I summarize this. And I know I've now gone over my hour. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. Hey, look at verse 14. Chapter 5, verse 14. It says at the end of that, it says, Adam, who is a type of the one to come. Okay? So what he, he is now, he's just made the statement that the whole reason why we still die is because Adam's sin brought the penalty, brought death to all mankind. That's why we still sin, or that's why we still die. So there's a relationship with Adam that we have. Now he says, Adam though is a type of Christ. So now he's, what he's going to do, he's going to go proving that there is a relationship between us and Christ now. But between us and Adam, it's the fact that he sinned, sin brought death. Between us and Christ now, it's that Christ rose from the dead, and so now it is life instead of death. We will be delivered from this death. And that's what the word typology is all about. Adam's the, the type, Jesus is the anti-type, and there's going to be similarities, but it's going to be different, because verse 15, you notice the word not. Okay, so he's, he's a type, he's a shadow, but he's not the real thing, and he doesn't reflect Jesus perfectly. There are some differences, and he's going to, Paul is going to bring those out in verses 15 through to 19. All right, so that's where Paul's going with the argument. He's going to prove now this statement that the only reason we still die is because death has not come off the table. And it's there because of Adam's sin. And he's going to prove to them uh, what he means in these verses ahead. So again, he's leading forward to chapter 8, which says those he predestined, he, he call, those he called, he justified, those he justified, he glorified. 5 verse 2, we have the hope, our boasting is that we have the hope of glory. How can we have the hope of glory? We're going to die. That's what the world says. 
And, and you talk to worldly people out there and they say, say, you say to them, what do you think the future holds? Well, we're, we live, then we're going to die. Well, what's after death? Some are going to say, there's nothing after death. It's hopeless. Others are going to say, well, I, I think there's a God, and I think he'll be, uh, I think he'll look at all the good I've done and think I did a good job. That's not hope. That's wishful thinking. Well, maybe if I appease him and, and do a bunch of works, if I, if I turn my knee to Mecca every day at a certain time, or, or if I go to, to the Eucharist uh, each week and, and, uh, and confess my sins, maybe then God will, will look at me in a good manner. It doesn't work that way. Because the problem is, is that the judgment of death is there. Because God has created life to, to exist. What are we going to... See, that's why he's, Paul is saying that it's not, you don't need the law to know the gospel. A lot of people in their evangelism will say, say have, you ever, have you ever sinned? Have you ever um, stolen anything? Have you ever uh, coveted something? Joanne coveted this morning. I did. She coveted... Um, um, <laughs> Linda's coat. Linda's, sorry. <laughs> Coming in Linda's jacket. Under the law, she would be condemned. That doesn't mean that I'm without the old covenant, but under the new covenant, that means, I mean, some people say, well, that means then she can cover all she wants under the new covenant. No, no, all the, the spirit, the, the, the attitude, the, the law behind the righteousness behind the law is still there, and the Spirit puts it in our hearts and minds. We know the coveting is still wrong. Not because of any law, but we know it because the Spirit is in us. Anyways, now I'm getting off track. So, it's all leading to chapter 8 about our glorious resurrection. The, the, the Jews and the Gentiles, they're free from the, the old covenant. It had its purpose. It was fulfilled. It was purpose was to show sin. And when we get to 520, he amplifies that purpose a little more. But we boast in the glory of God. Well, so Paul's going to argue the um, the reason why we still die is because of Adam's sin and the judgment, that wrath that remains until the day of resurrection. And so we will pick that up next time. Well. <clears throat> I hope you learned some new things today. I, I didn't plan to go this long. Um, it's, it's an exciting chapter. And believers should be encouraged. Because God thought of everything. He thought of everything. Not just dealing with our sin and our sinfulness, but He dealt with the judgment that overlooms us. And we all will die. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that does make things clear when we are willing to look at it closely and uh, to try to study it and understand it within the context and the flow of Paul's arguments. We, we thank you. We, we thank you that that um, even though death comes to us because of Adam's sin, uh, resurrection comes to us because of Jesus' resurrection. And that's how and why we are glorified. And, and what a thing to look forward to. So it, it tells us again that death is not an enemy. Death is not the final word for us. Death is, is not something to fear. Because we will be resurrected. We will be brought into your presence. We will receive the full inheritance of our salvation for which Jesus died. For that we are forever and eternally grateful and thankful. So on this Thanksgiving weekend, Lord, we are filled with thanksgiving for the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. But more than that, for the justification, and more than that, for the resurrection. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.